Welcome back everybody to our study of the law of contracts. In this video we're going to be talking about the next of the major issues when we examine the creation of contractual obligations, this being the intention to create legal relations. This is the second major test that we, that we have to think about when we think about whether or not a contract existed or not in a particular circumstance. You do this essentially after you've examined the fact that there is an agreement which is delineated between an offer and an acceptance of that offer. And then you have to think about whether or not that agreement in question is a legal agreement, i.e. whether or not the parties had intended for this agreement to be legally binding. And then once you've done that, we will talk about the next and final major hurdle to establishing the creation of a contract, which is, of course, the idea of consideration. We're moving away, therefore, from the idea of looking at the nature of agreement within the law of contract and now examining the next major element, the idea of uh, an intention to create legal relations, a contractual intent, sometimes as it is described. So let's just take an introduction to the idea of the intention to create legal relations. So far, what we have done is examined the agreement element of a contract, the idea that we have an offer and that there is an acceptance of that offer. We've explored all of the different modes and means and methods by which this is actually established. So we've spoken about, for example, the delineation between an offer and an invitation to treat. We've talked about the ways and methods of acceptance, whether or not you can accept an offer by conduct. We've talked about the postal rule, the rule that essentially provides that as soon as an acceptance of an offer has been posted, regardless of whether or not it has actually been received by the original offer or it is as still a valid acceptance. All of these things are very, very important for the establishment of the agreement. But a simple deference to the idea of agreement does not in and of itself create a legally binding contract just because we have an agreement about something does not mean that we have a contract. Even if we've shook hands and we agree that one thing is going to happen, and even if we have consideration, we have something in return for something else, this does not necessarily mean that a contract is legally binding. Because in addition to all of these things, we have to think about the idea of an intention to create legal relations. Because plenty of agreements that we can come to between parties, between individuals, between family members, between anybody, uh, can be uh, have all of the characteristics of legally binding contracts. They may have an offer and an acceptance. They may even be consideration. But they are still nevertheless not legally binding. If I arrange, for example, to go and meet a friend tomorrow and we agree a time, that agreement exists. There is an offer. Maybe somebody offers to go and meet, uh, to, to meet and, and I accept that offer. But that's an agreement that isn't legally binding. Could my friend therefore sue me if I, if I am late to this, uh, to this meeting, uh, even if we have agreed a specific time? Could they sue me for breach of contract? Well, usually the answer would be no. And the reason why the answer is no is potentially on a lack of consideration, but also, and more importantly in this case, on a lack of an intention to create legal relations. When I agree to and arrange to meet a friend and we agree at a specific time, we're not doing so with the expressed intention that this is going to be a contract, at least not all of my friends at least um, and then uh, the result in that is that if this is therefore breached in any kind of way if i'm late or if i if i cancel at a, a earlier time this does not mean that therefore i have breached a contract it just means that we have an agreement that has not been fulfilled there's no legal binding nature to it so the courts have to therefore make a delineation between agreements which have clearly got attached to them an intention to create legal relations and then also agreements which do not have this intention to create legal relations. For the most part, we distinguish this by looking at the different types of agreements that uh, exist. And the two major delineations that we can think of are agreements that exist within commercial contracts and, and, and the business structure that exists, in which case that there is, generally speaking, more of a presumption that there is an intention to create legal relations, or agreements that exist in social circles, uh, like I, the example that I looked at previously. This can be a broad range of different issues. It could also, in relation to familial circumstances in your family, but it could also be your friends, meeting your friends, your uh, uh, colleagues, acquaintances, all of these different things, you could have plenty of agreements there, but not necessarily have them be legally binding. So 
just like the example where I meet my friends, you can have plenty of different agreements that are made in what I've described here as social and domestic circumstances. So uh, agreement between friends, agreement between family, a, a parent and a child, a brother and a sister, etc, etc, etc. When it comes to these kinds of agreements, where there is a dispute and that dispute ends up in court, there is a presumption taken by the courts that these do not have attached to them an intention to create legal relations. This is the sort of baseline presumption which is established by the courts. It is then, therefore, for one party to rebut this presumption, to argue, in fact, even though the basic presumption is that domestic social uh, agreements do not have an intention to create legal relations, this one did have an intention to create legal relations. So this is the the establishment of uh, uh, the basic standard by which agreements that are made in social and domestic circumstances um, are established. Now, the alternative is that when we look at agreements that are made in commercial circumstances, the opposite is the case. It is actually the case that the courts presume that the agreement in question did have attached with it an intention to create legal relations, and it is for the uh, opposing side to argue that it didn't. So that is the, 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 there's a nice symmetry there between the two different kinds of agreements that we can generally understand in the world. We have domestic and social agreements like, like me meeting my friend, and you can also have business and commercial agreements uh, on the other hand. Um, and the, the, the symmetry that exists is that in the, in, the, in the first instance, in the social circles instance, there is a presumption that there is not an intention to create legal relations. In the commercial instance, there is a presumption that there is an intention to create legal relations. We'll get to that in more, uh, in more detail in the next lesson. But let's just illustrate this point in relation to domestic and familial circumstances by looking at the case from 1919 of Balfour and Balfour. In this case, the defendant had moved to England with his wife, who was the claimant. They moved from Kailon, which is uh, modern-day Sri Lanka, uh, or Ceylon, um, which is modern-day Sri Lanka. Uh, when it came time to move back to Sri Lanka, the wife, owing to ill health, made the decision that she was actually going to stay in England. Okay. The defendant agreed to this arrangement, and they also agreed that they were going to send um, around $30 a month as stipend. These uh, payments, when these payments then stopped, the claimant then sought to enforce this agreement as a contract. Remember, though, this is a defendant and uh, a claimant who are husband and wife. And so the result here is that the question of whether or not this arrangement had attached to it an intention to create legal relations. Uh, and so as a result of which the failure to provide these stipend payments, therefore, allows for a legally enforceable breach of contract claim. The courts held that there was no contract because of the fact that this was a relationship between a husband and wife. There is a presumption that there was no intention to create legal relations. And it was actually for the claimant to rebut this presumption to try and argue, in fact, that there was an intention to create legal relations, of course, which they were unable to do. There was also uh, issues relating to consideration in, in this case, um, uh, which we'll get to in future lessons, because, of course, there was no consideration uh, in the fact that uh, the defendant was just essentially giving a £30 or $30 a month stipend uh, in, and getting nothing in return for it. So there was actually a lack of consideration, too. But in terms of for, for our purposes and what was important to it for this lesson is that there was also not an intention to create legal relations. In the case of Jones and uh, Pavadon, uh, Pav, uh, sorry, Pad Avaton <laughs> from 1969, uh, we also have the illustration of there being a presumption that exists that, that no intention to create legal relations existed, specifically within familial relationships. The case itself involves a mother and a daughter. Um, the mother had made a promise to her daughter that she would provide her with a house and some money uh, while she was studying for the bar. Anybody who is studying law should know what the bar is. Essentially, it's the process by which an individual becomes a barrister. After six years, the daughter had failed to pass the bar. She wasn't particularly good. And therefore, the mother had sought repossession of the property. The daughter argued that she had no authority to do so, owing that a contract had been created between the mother and her daughter uh, in the fact that there was a promise for the daughter to have a house and some money while she was studying for the bar. And again, this is illustrative of the point that there is a presumption that is taken by the courts of a lack of an intention to create legal relations because in following from Balfour and Balfour, owing to the lack of intention, the mother did not have a contract with the daughter. And so as a result of which the mother could have done whatever she wanted in relation to the repossession of the property.
Hello everybody and welcome back to Contract Law for the Law Academy. As a quick introduction, if you want to support this project of education for the subject of law, uh, please consider becoming a channel member. You will have access to a number of additional pieces of content and material, as well as early access to a lot of these videos that uh, will be released on a weekly basis. Uh, and Generally speaking, the, the idea here is just that you will be um, supporting the creation of this new content. Alternatively, if you want to make a one-off donation, please consider using the Super Thanks option under the video as well. Um, for this video, however, we're going to continue talking about the creation of contracts, and we are going to talk about the concept of commercial agreements and how this relates to the intention to create legal relations. The previous lesson um, introduced the subject of an intention to create legal relations. Uh, we noted that depending on the particular context in question, the court will give more or less deference to whether or not a particular agreement had attached with it an expressed intention to create legal relations. And so really it is the, 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 the court that um, has a certain amount of discretion in making a determination as to uh, whether or not an intention to create legal relations existed in a particular circumstance. We noted that when it comes to social context, so when it comes to contracts between friends, uh, between families, there the courts will apply a presumption that there was no intention established. And it is then for the parties who are trying to argue that there was in fact a, 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 a presumption, uh, so that there was in fact an intention um, to rebut that presumption, to provide evidence to the effect that there was a presumption to create uh, legal relations. That is how it works when we talk about an intention to create, le create legal relations within the social context. This video is going to talk about the ways in which an intention to create legal relations is examined and viewed within a commercial context, when it, when it comes to commercial contracts, contracts between businesses, contracts between private individuals and businesses. So the courts will essentially um, take the exact opposite standard when it comes to commercial agreements versus when they talk about social agreements. So when it comes to a social agreement, as I've mentioned, there is a presumption that there was no intention to create legal relations. And then it is for the uh, aggrieved parties who want to argue that there was an intention to provide evidence to the effect that essentially rebuts that presumption. When it comes to commercial agreements, there is um, a presumption that there was an intention. So there, there was an intention, and it is therefore up to the parties who are trying to argue that it wasn't an intention to create legal relations to provide evidence to rebut the in presumption of intention. OK, so when it comes to commercial contracts, there is a presumption of intention. When it comes to non-commercial social contracts, there is a presumption of no intention. That is the distinction between the two. So it is the opposite mirrored approach to that of the social contracts that we looked at in the previous lesson. Let's see how this is illustrated in uh, the with a case. We have the case from 1925 of Rose and Frank Co versus uh, Junior Crompton and Bros Limited. Now. The case itself involved a commercial agreement, or a commercial arrangement, shall I say, for the sale of paper goods. The parties had entered into an agreement in relation to an office arrangement. Uh, the, the agreement itself included a clause which made it very clear that there was not an intention on the part of the parties for the arrangement in question to be a legal arrangement. So they had a relation, uh, they had a had a, an arrangement, they had a, an arrangement which by all in large would look like a contract and would look like a legal contract. But one of the clauses within this arrangement was that, there, that the arrangement wasn't legal, it wasn't a contract. And that it was instead just a, quote, honourable pledge. So then the relationship, when it subsequently breaks down between the claimant and the, and the defendant, one of them, the claimant, wanted to sue for a breach of contract. They wanted to sort of ignore the fact that they've said that it wasn't legal and they take it to court and try and have uh, their, their day in court uh, for a breach of contract. The issue for the courts was whether or not the specific clause in question, the clause saying that this was not a legal contract, whether or not that um, would be enough to void contractual intention, despite all the other factors suggesting that a contract has taken place. So, fundamentally, 
for all intents and purposes, a contract existed in this particular environment, in this particular setting. And so the question here is, fundamentally, does the fact that there was one single clause that suggested that there was not a contract void everything else? When it comes to specifically the intention, it was held by the House of Lords that this clause did indeed negate the legally binding nature of the uh, of the contract of the agreement, given that the courts were looking for an intention to create legal relations. There is an intention on the part of the parties to actually go into a contract to go into an agreement and for that agreement to be legal in nature. So if you're looking for intent, if you're looking for intentionality, then a clause that specifically rules out any kind of legal um, uh, arrangement therefore suggests that there wasn't an intent for it to be a legally binding agreement. And therefore the claimant's um, claim for breach of contract broke down owing to the fact that there wasn't a contract in the first place. Continuing on then, well, let's think about the case of Kleinworth Benson Limited versus Malaysian Mining Corp from 1989. In this case, we have uh, a contractual uh, intention relates to this idea of something known as a comfort letter. The defendant in this case had been the owner of a subsidiary who was trading in London, uh, the London Metal Exchange. A loan had been issued by the claimant to the defendant's subsidiary. And then when the subsidiary went into liquidation, it went into insolvency and broke down into liquidation, went into bankruptcy. Uh, there was this issue of repayments back to the original claimant. In the original agreement, there included this idea of a comfort letter, which is a statement issued by an accounting firm, which examines uh, uh, examining and assuring the financial stability of a of a company. So. The accounting firm um, looks at the company and um, essentially um, provides some kind of statement as to the financial stability of that company. The letter stated that, quote, it is our policy to ensure that the business of the subsidiary is at all times in a position to meet its liabilities to the claimant. Liabilities, of course, things that it is owed. Um, this is just an ordinary um, condition within the general uh, rules and the general parts of business. The Court of Appeal held that the comfort letter did not have any contractual effect. And we have this particular quote here to give an instance of what this means and why they argue that this was the case. So they say that, but in this case, it is clear in my judgment that the concept of a comfort letter to which the parties had resort when the defendant uh, refused to assume joint and several liability or to give a guarantee was known by both sides at least to extend to or to include a document under which the defendants would give comfort to the plaintiff, plaintiff sorry, by assuming not a legal liability to ensure repayment of the liabilities of its subsidiary, but a moral responsibility only. So, in fact, the, the, the assumption, the presumption of an intention to create legal relations could not have been relied upon with the issuance of the comfort letter, owing to the fact that there was no legal responsibility, but only a moral responsibility.